Well, good morning. Good morning. I make sure y'all are here with me this morning. It's good to see all of you. Man, it is, uh, it is, um, oh, I can't move that, shoot. Okay, I'm going to scoot over a little bit. Uh, it is great to be back, yeah. <laughs> Leave and everything goes awry. It's all because of Laura. Hey, it's great. I'm Pastor Andrew. It's great to be back. Uh, for those of you that may not know, I have been away. My wife and I were away for a few weeks and uh, got a little break. We were back last Sunday, uh, kind of getting ourselves back uh back on board, but uh, this morning I am so, I love, listen, listen, I am glad to be back in this room, and man, I missed it. I miss being here, I miss being in this room, I miss being here with you where I can sing real loud. I was singing real loud a few minutes ago, and I hit a note in my head, and I thought, man, I'm not a musician, but I know that wasn't right. (laughs) That's when you know it's bad. But that's when it's good because you're just at a place where you just you just fall into to love with the Lord and uh, man it's just a just great to be back in this room where we sing together where we declare who God is where we're living life together in community. But if I'm going to really be honest with you, I love and miss this room, but I'm I'm not sure I'm really ready to be back. I had a good time. I didn't miss the things that I have to do every week. And so those of you may be wondering, my wife and I got the chance to go hang out at the beach a little bit. And if you're visiting with us, we're glad that uh, you're here. And I kind of want to just, I'm not going to share with you all of the things we did on the trip. They consisted of about three things. We walked on the beach, we sat in the, by the pool and by the beach, and we read books. I said, <laughs> we are just boring old people. <laughs> And uh, we did nothing. We practiced the art of doing nothing. We, I would turn to my wife a couple of times and I'd go, I need to tell you what I'm fixing to do is nothing. I may be reading this book, but I'm doing nothing. Or I may take a walk, but I'm doing nothing. So we had a great time. But one of the things we got to do uh, that was a little bit over the top is uh, we got to go to a baseball game. And my wife and I, and I don't understand how this happened because baseball... Uh, has, was not really, really good to us. Baseball is very, very good for me. It's just what, it's okay. My kids didn't play. Seth played t-ball, I think, was the only baseball experience we had in our life. He was the best dandelion picker in right field you've ever seen in your life. We looked out there one time, I've told the story before, we looked out there one time and he had taken one of his little matchbox cars and he's down there with his glove and he's driving this car all over his glove and the game's going on. We just didn't excel at baseball even though I'm a natural born athlete. So I don't understand why we never, why, why baseball is just, my wife and I love it. I mean, we're just, I don't know, we're just, just, we're just into this thing and we love the Tampa Bay Rays and so we got the chance to go to a baseball game. And we actually went to two. We got to go to the, the, the American Division of League Championship games. And so I, I want to share with you just a little picture of what that looked like. And there we are. And uh, we were, yeah, it was great. Yeah, I don't know why are you clapping because I'm at the baseball game. I don't know. I don't know what's wrong with y'all. So th- this, this, this is, this is uh, a picture that I took. And um, I sent it to about three people because I knew the three people that I sent it to would be so ticked off that I was at that game. I sent it to them because they're big baseball fans, and so that's the only reason I sent it. It's the only reason that I took it. Uh, and a few months ago, in the world of the porch, several months ago, actually, they did a series called Instagram Theology. The porch is our young adult ministry, and, and we partner, we watch a live stream, and we meet every Tuesday. Uh, we presently are meeting at our house. But a few months ago, they did this um, series called Instagram Theology. And the, the speaker, David, shared this perspective. He said he got on a plane one day, and he saw the girl in front of them in the plane start making herself up. And when she got herself all made up and her hair all tucked up and whatever, she took a selfie of herself in the plane and then immediately went to some program. I guess he was, you know, snooping. Anyway, he was looking, watching her go to, and she was, she was morphing the picture, editing the picture, adding some, I don't know, whatever. She was just fixing it up. And then immediately sending the picture out and posting it to the world. And I was like, God, there's just no way. We're sitting at this ball game. 
it was just early on. We had to go early because, you know, we had to, I don't know, we just had to be there early. Somebody made us be there early. And so we're there early, and no, a lot of, there weren't a lot of people around us. It wasn't long before everything filled up around us. Sitting right in front of us was a family of seven. And the, the moment that they sat down, the mother began to take out her phone. And I promise you, if she took one selfie, she took 95. And every one of them, it, I don't think she saw a pitch. I don't think she saw a hit. I don't think she stood up one time. But by gosh, she's got 95 selfies to prove that she was at the ball game. Some looking this way. I was like dive bombing some of them, you know, that kind of thing. And then she's got some this way. And she had some, I mean, she had every, she had some her, her kissing her husband. She had her, some holding her child. I mean, endless amounts of selfies that she took. And I was like, oh my gosh, I'm actually seeing what David talked about. I never thought that it would be true. I'm visualizing. It's happening right in front of me. I was like, this is crazy. And I watched it. I kept, I kept doing this to Julie all night, you know, like, because she was there and we were just kind of thinking about it. The next day, I'm, this is the honest truth. The next day, we're, we're doing our thing. We're sitting on the sand. And I look up and this girl comes out. She lays her towel down. And within five minutes, she begins to start taking selfies of herself. She's like laying this way on the blanket. She's laying this way on the blanket. She's taking it from the sand. She's taking it from the sky. And me, she must have took 75. I'm like, oh, my gosh, this is crazy. It's blowing my mind. And honest engine, promise, this is the truth that I'm going to tell you. Honestly, I'm going to tell you the truth. I was standing on my balcony the next morning as the sun was coming up. I just finished my run. It was actually already up, and it was run, and people were starting to go out to the beach. And I look over in one of the little cabanas, and there's a woman, and she's sitting there with her phone. She has a little hat on. She begins to take selfies of herself on the beach. And this is the truth. She took the hat off, put it away, got another hat out, <laughs> took a picture of her on the beach. And I'm like... Okay, I'm like, Lord, I'm not sure what you are doing to me here, but I, in, in 24 hours, I have experienced something I heard that I thought would never happen in my own life, and I saw it happen through that. And it just got me, we're, we're, we just got me to thinking about this idea of ourself, this idea of who we are in self. And so we're, we're introducing an, a new piece to you. These people worked really hard at, at their self. And so today we're starting a new series, and the series of the title is called this, Hello, My Name is Self. And we're going to talk for a few weeks about self. We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna pull off some things here that I, I think are, are unique, not only to us as individuals, but as, as a culture, but also unique to us as those who follow Christ. And so, hello, my name is Self. John last, man, what a, listen. Commercial, my gosh, if you missed any of the four weeks, five, however I was long, that John dropped on us, this Remind series, you need to go back and listen to it in the podcast world. They were amazing. Deep, really good stuff. Not like what you're going to get this morning, okay? This is really good. I mean, it would just, it set the plate to remind us of really kind of who we are. I want to do that a little bit at the end. But these things that we, we sometimes we just they get lost in the space of our life in Christ. But today we're going to talk about, hello, my name is Self. This is sort of kind of our intro into that. I did a little quick research. Let me give you some quick insight because I don't want to be lost in the sea. And this service, this message is not about the selfie, but I just thought it might be interesting that apparently the first selfie was taken in 1897. Yeah, you can look at this all Wikipedia proven. And if you can look it up... <laughs> It's a picture of a guy who took a picture of himself and he had a busted lip and it's this really cool thing. That's what everybody pronounces that. A few years ago, the word selfie became a real word. It was introduced and in, in, in Oxford Dictionary put it in and said, yeah, this is now a real word. I'm still waiting for him to use one of my words in the dictionary, but that's another story for another day. The selfie is intended to show an external experience, but never an internal a selfie is a way in which we can look at what's happening around in the moment in the snapshot of the space, but it's never intended to show what's happening on the inside. It's the reality of an anticipated reality that you want a, an experience to hold in its space. It's the idea of something that might be coming. It's the anticipation. It's a capsule of the anticipation of a moment. It's the anticipation of something that I don't ever want to let go of this. 
because this is what I want it to be. There's a whole lineage of things that when we take that imagery and we, we say, this is the selfie that I've taken, it's, it's, it's a stopping of, of the moment that says, this is, this is me. And there's just something about this that is uncertain for me, not the selfie at all. This is not about selfies. We're pretty much leaving selfies behind now. This is about self. This is about an understanding of recognizing that, hello, my name is self. Hello, this is who I am. This is, this is what I am portraying to be. These women who went through this, this woman went through a litany of hats to create just the right perspective. Some in the sun, some not in the sun. To say to the world in this moment, I'm okay with this now. Here, this is who I am. And, and in her mind, there might be an anticipated reality of what that is. Maybe, I don't know, maybe she was, I have no idea. It just was amazing to me that we would spend so much time trying to project the self of, of, of something that is external when we as followers of Christ know it's the internal. So how do we make the jump? How do we make the bridge? John chapter 4, there's a story of a woman at the well. And let me just help you today a little bit. I, I, I'm going to be in several stories throughout throughout the New Testament and some other places. I'm just going to reference the story in a little part of the story. So if, if you get lost or you don't know the story, I'll do my best to give you a little background. But, but I, I need you to just kind of be, no, be okay with that, not feel like that I don't know the story because I have read the Bible once or twice. Not all the way through yet. I'm still working on that. I'm sorry. There's my confession for the day. I told you all that. that the, the pastor has a, I'm a, I'm, I've, I've, I've not read Leviticus yet. I'm still holding out on reading Leviticus. But I, 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 I know the stories, but I just want you to understand that this is about self, and we're going to point some things out about the characteristics of self and how they work, lay this foundation. So in John chapter 4, verse 1 to 15, we find the story of the woman at the well who Jesus goes and meets, and she's drawing water out of the well. And as she draws water out of the well, she's having this conversation with Jesus, and, and Jesus says this to her. He says, Anyone who drinks of the well will soon become thirsty again. But those who drink of the water that I give will never be thirsty again. It, it becomes a fresh bubbling spring within them, giving them eternal life. This thing that we have with Christ gives us this life. That's what he's saying. He said, man, this, is, this gives you life. This brings you and me together is, is what sustains our life. And, he, and he, he says in the first verse, it says, if you, if, if you want to drink of this water, you'll drink of it. And as you drink of it, guess what? You're going to thirst again. And he's simply indicating that if you keep drinking of this water, you're going to have to continually drink of it in order for yourself to be satisfied, in order for yourself to be, be whatever you need to be. I think this lays for us the box of understanding about Christ in our life and Christ in ourself. And that's what we're going to do over the next few weeks is talk about these elements and these places and these pieces of ourself that bring us into a place of Christ. So I have three simple little things for you today. Number one, God sees and knows everything about me. He's just not looking at the selfie of me or what I say about myself. He knows everything about you. We did a journey a few weeks or a, a year or so ago. We did Imagine a Church, and we walked through the book, Come and See, and the, pre, the principle of the book, Come and See, is found in a story where Jesus is talking to Nathaniel and Philip, and they're in this process of, of, of Philip is bringing Nathaniel to, to Jesus, and he's saying, man, you've got to come and see who this Christ is and what he has done. You're not going to believe it. And he goes, I don't know. He said, well, just come and see. So Nathaniel goes to see Jesus, and we find this discourse happening. And it says, as they approach, Jesus said, now here's a genuine son of Israel, a man of complete integrity. He looks at him and he says, man, here, this is a son of Israel. He, he looks at him and he says, hey, you're a son of Israel. You're a man of integrity. The next line says, how did you know that about me? It's like, what mystery voodoo do you have that you know that these two things about me? I've never met you. I've never been a part of you. And he's, it's just, he's, he's caught in a chaotic moment because he doesn't understand that. And Jesus said, well, I could see you. He says, I could see you under the fig tree before Philip even found you. What? Let me help you with something this morning. Jesus sees you. This Jesus knows everything about me. He knows he knows everything about you. In John chapter 5, verse 6, 
We find another story where a man is ill and Jesus comes up and he says, Jesus saw him and knew he had been ill for a long time. Jesus knew. Listen, just put it out there really fast. He knows everything about you. If for somehow in your mind you think that you're able or we're able to manipulate and hide from God, we can't. He knows every sin we, 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 we befall upon our life. He knows every mistake that we make. He knows every fail that we make. He knows every misstep that we make. But let me tell you what else he knows about us. He also knows when we exercise a perfect biblical faith kingdom principle in our life that does value. He knows when we strive and we're hunger and thirst for him. He knows the sin. It's not always that he knows bad because we see God as this hand slapper. We see God as the one who wants to execute the ruler on us. And, and so be it. He doesn't necessarily operate that way, but he sees and he knows the good and he knows the bad. So he knows not just what I want him to see. Listen, I spent, and I'm going to talk about this in a few minutes, but I spent so much of my life saying, hey, God, look, <laughs> here's my selfie. Here's who I am. I did this for you. Man, I, 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 I organized our church for years to, to travel to far lands and to do, to do work around the world. Here, God, Snap the picture. This is what I need you to see, God. But he sees more than just the picture. He sees everything in who I am. And I, I think we know that. But in the context of self, we have to be reminded that, that, number one, God knows everything about me. Number two, man, we will get through these really fast. Number two, God looks at me. God looks at me as Jesus looks at me, not as I want him to look at me. I can put all kinds of things up before God. And say, hey, look at me, look at me. This is the way I want you to see me, God. I mean, did you see me do this? Did you, did you watch me do this exercise? God, this is what I need you to see. Listen to me, let me help you something. In the midst of your uncertainty, in the midst of your brokenness, in the midst of our sin, in the midst of our good things we do, in the midst of our failed relationships, in the midst of everything in our life, in the midst of our sickness, our illnesses, our disease, let me help you with something. God sees us through Jesus Christ. Those are the eyes which he sees us. We all know the story super well in John chapter 8, verse 9 through 11. It's, the it's, one of, it's one of the most beautiful, epic pictures we have of God and how he interacts with us in this ultimate new life we're going to have in Christ, this new relationship we're going to have. And, and it's the story where the, the Pharisees find this woman who is doing something wrong and the snapshot of her life is not very pretty. It's torrent, it's tattered, it's beaten, it's scarred. It's riddled with men. It's riddled with circumstance. It's riddled with badness. It's riddled with shame. It's riddled with deceit. It's probably riddled with disease. And by very nature, now listen, just bear with me. By the very nature of the eyes that God looked at man at that time with, what the Pharisees were coming to do to her was by law the right thing to do. Meaning that, that someone who was caught in such a way, there, was, there were rules and regulations that were to be carried out against her. But through the eyes of Jesus, it takes on a different perspective in God's eyes. When God looked at her through the eyes of Jesus, the story changes. And so in John chapter 8, verse 9, 10, and 11, we find this little discourse. And it says, when the accusers heard this they slipped away one by one, being the oldest, until Jesus was the only one left in the middle of the crowd of the woman. These Pharisees, these men who were wanting to destroy this woman and kill her and stone her for, the, for what she was and who she was. Jesus looked at them and said, hey, which one of you don't have a sin? Which one of you have not failed? Then you cast the stone. And one by one, they began to walk away until there were none. Why? Because all have sinned. And they dropped their stones and they walked away. And then I love this line. We, we, we should all just know it well. Then Jesus stood up again and said to her, where are your accusers? Didn't even one of them condemn you? And she said, no, Lord. And Jesus said, neither do I. Go and sin no more. God saw her through Christ. God saw her through what Christ had, was doing or going to do. As Christ gives his life and dies for you and me on the cross and restores us and renews us and gives us hope and grace and joy and all those things, when God looks at us, that's how he sees us. 
let me help you with this. My friend Adam, is that Adam? Adam, I don't know where Adam is. Adam McManus. Adam's not here anymore, is he? Oh, yeah, there he's in the back. Um, Adam gave me a Bible, and it's a Bible that is, is, a, is a trekker-themed Bible, has, has trekking, hiking kind of metaphor to it. I love it. And so I took that, well, actually, I have it right here. I took this with me on my vacation. This is the only book I took with me, as opposed to someone else in my family. 29. Did I tell you there were 29 books that made a drive to <laughs> Florida and back? 29. I'm not throwing around. I'm not doing nothing. I'm just telling you she took 29. I took one. Mine was spiritual. Hers were not. I don't know what more to tell you about our life. Oh, wow. That was bad. She said that to me by the pool one day. She said, well, you're over there being all spiritual and I'm not. So I, you can talk to her. My wife loves Jesus more than I do. Does that help? I don't know. What do I do with that? Some of her books were spiritual. They were printed by Thomas Nelson. So that, y'all missed that. That was a good one there, I thought. Okay, so let's see. Where were we? We were talking about this Bible. This Bible. So I decided that, I, 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 but when I tell you what I'm going to tell you, you realize I'm not as spiritual as you thought. I, I, this Bible gives you a, a reading method that lets you read the Bible from beginning to end as a story with kind of pulling down the highlights. So for those of us, and let me just do this now. I'm, I'm just too deep now. This is the added time. Um, when I was in school, the teacher would make an assignment, and she would say, here, read this book. And you would look at the book, and you would go, man, I can't read that book. At least I would say, I can't read that book. So guess what I would do? I'd go get the cliff notes. And so the cliff notes were this big. And I'd look at that and go, mm, no, I can't read that. I'm going to go talk to somebody about it and let them tell me about the book. And that's what I would do. And so this Bible does the same thing. It has a reading plan that's real, real small and tiny as if you were just telling somebody, hey, let me just tell you the story. And it kind of goes through and maybe has about 40 different things you can read and go, okay. And then it has a, a sequence that's like a cliff note that's like, like 150 things you can read in chronological order. And then it has one that has almost 400 lengthy readings from Scripture that are chronological that help you understand the globalness of, of God's Word. So I decided that, you know what I wanted to do? I just wanted to revisit the story of the gospel. And so I'm in the midst of that journey right now. And so I would just sit and read this chronological journey on, on my vacation. And I would take it and I would read it and I would just, I would just, I would read things that I knew the story, but I would read more of the whole story. And I kind of forgot a few things. And you know one of the things I forgot? That in the Old Testament, God had a different set of eyes that he was looking at people with. The eyes that he was looking with people in the Old Testament was, hey, you've done that, cursed are you to die. Hey, you didn't sacrifice that lamb right? Guess what? You're out. If your sacrifice wasn't good enough when it was brought to the temple, guess what? You didn't make it back home. Guys, I know that that seems distant and far for us to understand, but those were the eyes and the rules in which God was seeing them. For us, he sees us through Christ's eyes. When God looks at us, he has to look through Christ first to see me. And that is an amazing revelation for me because it changes how I play the game. It changes for me how I live for Christ. Because here's what I know. Number three is God will not reject me. He won't reject me for who I am or what I've done or where I've missed it or where I've fallen short or even the good things I've done or the fakeness that I've been or whoever. He will not reject me. Why? Because Psalms 51, 17 says, the sacrifice you desire is a broken spirit and you will not reject the broken and repentant heart. 2 Corinthians 12, 9 says, each time he said, my grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. So now I am glad to boast about my weakness so that the power of Christ can work through me. Wow. I'm not, I'm not stuck in this place of not knowing that Christ is with me and for me and sees me as I'm broken and as I'm weak and as I'm successful and as I'm a failure because he sees me in Christ. 
He sees me in Christ's death and his resurrection. He sees me in Christ's love and his grace and his forgiveness. He sees me. He knows me that way. And sometimes our self does not remember that. Sometimes our self is too busy doing what I did most of my life and saying whatever what everybody says about me, then that's who I am to God. Oh, pastor, you're, God, you're such a good pastor. People say that to me. And I'll go, oh, thank you. And I go, take the picture. Here, God, here I am. I'm a good pastor. Man, you guys have given millions away to form it. Here, God, here's my picture. And the self that I become, this person that I had become all these years of my life, my reality was not real. It was a false reality. It was a false understanding. Because I was looking at myself not in the way that God looks at me through the eyes of Christ and what Christ has done for me, but I was looking at myself in the eyes of the people around me. Because the people around me, what they thought or what their perception was about me was more important than my relationship to God. A few years ago, I kind of came to the crashing halt realization of that. That I was not at all, at all who I thought I was in Christ. I was who I was, who I thought I was as the world told me I was. As I told myself I was. I came to the reality to understand that this illusion of being grand and glorious, this illusion of all my failures that I possessed, I, I, I see myself as a failure or see myself as being uncertain or see myself as not succeeding, which is something I struggled with all of my life to, for, for years but didn't really understand or didn't really know it. Man, I struggled deeply with rejection of people. I can't stand being rejected by somebody. It destroys me emotionally and mentally. I would see myself in that rejection instead of seeing me as how Christ sees me. And I would go, and I would put that snapshot up. And I would say, I would say, this is who I am. I'm the pastor. I'm the leader. I'm the spiritual one. I've done this. I've done that. And I would keep that inner person, that self, in a secret place, in a hidden place. I would create this illusion about the things and the stuff of who I was became honest with myself and recognized that the grace of Christ sees through all of that. If Hubert tells me that I'm a great, wonderful person, snap it and throw it up and let the world know that. Hubert says I'm a great guy. When I actually out and broken, I was messed up. I was trying to do things on my own, my own skill, my own abilities, my own accords, my family name. Can I tell you how many times I used my dad's name to try to get somewhere to do something or to, to, to lend credibility to who I was? Hey, let me sit down with you and meet you for the first time. Hey, how are you? Good. My name is Andrew Gray. What's your name? My name is Andrew, just like the little card says. My name is Andrew Gray. Nice to meet you. Hey, well, let me tell you. Well, what do you? Well, I have three children, one of them. And now, how can I make this feel so good? I have three kids. Two of them played college soccer. How about that? That makes me something. My identity was identified in the things maybe of others or the things of this world when the true identity of who we are is who are we in Christ. And most of us as faith followers will go, amen, pastor. Who are we in Christ, by golly gee gum? When all along there is this, there is this, the shield of the self to God. And, and I just want to share openly with you that Listen, we're, we're, we're moving toward breaking the shield down. We've been working for several years in this, it's particularly one year, as we've been teaching, John and I and others have just been just sharing openly about where we believe we are as Christ followers. Not in something we have created, not in a facade, not in a selfie that stands in front of, of, of who we really are. We're going we're gonna to get rid of the selfie. We're going to ban the selfie in our relationship to God. We're going to strike it from our, our dictionary. Because we want the self of who we are to come into the space of honest, open relationship with Christ and let us see ourselves as how Christ sees us. Because I don't think we do that. Because here's what happens to us. Most of us don't remember or recall who Christ really says we are. Let me help you with this just a little bit. 
If I say to myself that I am this, that I'm this person, or I'm this way, listen, let me, let me help you with something. I could sit here all morning long and tell y'all that I'm a natural born athlete. I could say that and I could say that a hundred times. And most of you that have been around me know that I probably am. But that being set aside, the truth of the reality is I'm really not. On our vacation, it was kind of funny. I don't know how this whole, this is really, really, I shouldn't tell this all myself, but I will. Somehow or the other, in the conversation with one of the guys that was hanging out there at the, at the, the, the place with us, we had struck up a conversation and we had talked about our things and whatever. And somehow or the other, in a jovial conversation, I made that statement that I was a natural born athlete. I don't know why it came up. It just seems to come up all the time. <laughs> when you have this physique, it just comes out, I guess. I don't know. Anyway, and so a few hours went by, and we were in the pool, and people were pooling, doing pooly things, and he hummed this football at me. <laughs> it's time to show off. And I just turned and in a second glance made this amazing like one hand grab out of midair like you know Randy Moss maybe would that be a good reference okay like Randy Moss I don't know that's all I can think of and, it, and I just grabbed it and pulled it back and he goes my gosh you are a natural born athlete <laughs> it's heaven it's like yes one human gets it this identity of who I am is found in these things that I feel like that I can do in reality, I wouldn't want to be on any football field today. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if any was in Christ, he's a new creature. He's a new, we are a new creation. The old things have passed away, and behold, the new things have come. We have become new. These are the eyes to which God sees you. You sit here in a divorce, you sit here in a, 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 a horrific life, abuse, addiction place you are. You sit here in a, a selfie world where you're refusing, where we refuse, where I refuse to let anyone in. In the years of pastoring this church and not being full with and honest in where God was in my life, guess what? He saw me and he saw me through the eyes of grace. He sees us where we are. And when we come to him, we become this new creation. We don't just become at one time. It is this ongoing journey that he beckons us to. That's who Christ sees me as. That's who I want to be. Galatians chapter 2, 20 says, I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And so long we know that and we scream it from our vocal cords and declare it. But in the reality, we keep throwing up these, these snapshots that hinder our real selves from being open and vulnerable to who God is and wants to be in our life. I'm a new creature in him. I am crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. There's those lenses. There's those eyes to which God sees us. No longer are we trapped under these, these rudimentary laws. We're trapped under new law of love and grace and hope and joy. Galatians 3.26, for Jesus, for in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God. We are God's sons. We have been called to him. John chapter 15, we did a series. Well, I keep saying a series. We, we're doing this, this, this series of infinity on the book of John that we have been in for several years now. That every time we kind of take a little break from a series, well, Siri just is talking to me up here. This is hilarious. Did y'all hear that? Sorry, she interrupted my notes. She's a bad girl. <laughs> that was pretty bad. Sorry about that. We've been in this, we have been in a series on John. And about every, every four or five months, we'll step into it for four or five weeks. And the last time we were in it, we spent a lot of time talking about John 15. With this whole illustration of the vineyard and the vines and the, being connected to the vine and, and who, who we are in Christ and how that we bear fruit. And listen to what it says. It says, no longer do we call ourselves servants. No longer do we call ourselves servants. But it says, the Lord, he has called us friends. He has called us friends. He, he says, that, and there's another passage in John 15 that says, if you remain in me, I will remain in you. He is our friend. I, listen. Listen. The last several years of my life have been radically transformed by, by a couple of things, but one of those major things that has been transformed is the understanding of what true friendship really looks like and walking it out with individuals. 
who've walked through me with dark, dark, darkened days, and they're right there with me, living authentic and sharing life open and counseling me biblically and encouraging me appropriately and admonishing me right, pursuing me relationally, not just, not just, wow, what can I do for you or what relationship can I be for you or what name do you have? Genuine relationship that walks out the test of time and, and, and sees God move in the right appropriate capacity and continues to daily be renewed. It's, it's been life-changing for me. And when I see how that looks and I recognize that I lay that upon the, the, the idea of who God is as a friend to me, it changes my perspective of wanting to say, hey, God, here I am. Make sure you come over here and be with me because I'm, I've done this and this and this. Because these people elevated me to this position, you, God, should respect me. It's kind of how I lived my life for a long time. And I've repented of that. Because he doesn't see me through those lenses. He sees me through these lenses. He is my friend, and if I remain in him, he will remain in me. This is the self that I want. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, 16 says, Do you not know that you're God's temple and his spirit dwells there in you? Man, how many times, God, I ask you, I ask you even today to forgive me that I say that which is such whippetness off my lips, and I realize that your spirit dwells in me? The same spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells within me. And I know you go, well, I don't get it. Man, listen, we get it because we see ourselves through the eyes of what Christ has done. Just a couple of more. I'll give you this quote. Often I keep saying and I feel empty because I'm not taking advantage of what's available to me in him. I feel empty in my life my selfie might be perfect and positioned just right that, I, that, that is in front of me that I'm putting out there, but I feel empty because the things that God has provided for me, I've not taken advantage of. Have I taken advantage of the fact that his spirit dwells within me? Have I taken advantage of the very fact that he is my friend? Have I taken advantage of these things and pulled them close to me? And then it goes on to say this. What is accessible to me today that lets me have a chance to experience him and become that self? What are the things that you have access to in the kingdom of God, in the church that you live in, in the, where you reside, in the scriptures that you hold in your hand or that you read on your phone or that lay beside your bedstand, in the relationships that are around you and the people who are around you? What do you have, what do we have access to that lets me experience this self that we have been talking about? And, and John masterfully laid out some beautiful things over the last several weeks that, 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 that lead us into that space. I hunger and thirst in this life as a pastor, as a leader, with my staff, with John, to see, we sing about it, to see our lives change for him. What do you mean change for him? To be full in him. Not to just be, to be full. We, we tout a scripture a lot, and you're going to be hearing it over the next several months. To be fully known and fully loved. To be fully known and fully loved is such a beautiful, Facebookable, tweetable graphic, isn't it? With a little sunshine in the background, maybe. And send it to the whole world and say to be fully known and fully loved. And you just feel it just drip off the screen when you read it. I just wonder for how many people that's the selfie of their life. But behind the selfie, they're just not fully known. Because we're afraid. We're afraid to walk in the space that truly is God. We're afraid to walk into a space that might be uncomfortable for us. Because we want someone to see us. When in reality, he's asking that the world sees him. What are we doing today that gives us full access to who he is so that the world sees us? Sees him, not us. We want them to see us. You know how I know that? Because I lived that way for years of my life. I need you to see me, and I need you to see what I've done. I need you to see how I've achieved. I need you to see the achievements around me. Here they all are. Now, I'm defined by those. And what you're looking at when you look, you see me. And he says, it is not I who dwells in me, but Christ who lives in me. 
So the next few weeks, the next couple of months in our, and this is, this is not really a visionary message, but I guess it could be a little bit. We're going to decide. We, not we're going <laughs> to. Let me rephrase that. We and our team have decided that we're going to take a journey into ourselves, And we're going to come to the place where we, as a body, as a church, we're fully known and we're fully loved. You can fully know everything about me, and you need to be able to fully love me because that's the way of Christ. Those are the eyes of Christ, and anything shy of that is not life in him. It's not the selfie that we all desire. The selfie that I desire is fully known and fully loved. When you look at me, listen, I don't want you looking at me. Do not, right now, if you look at me and see me, I have news for every one of you in this room. This guy is going to fail you. I'm going to prep yourself. I'm going to say a word that's going to embarrass you. I'm going to mislead you in something, not intentionally. You come to me and we talk personally and individually. I may mess up. I may mess up in my own life. I may sin. I, I, guys, I, I, I am susceptible to sin but I'm going to be fully known and fully loved about it because my Christ, the eyes which God sees me, he sees me that he knows that about me. I still am victorious. I still march forward. I still love Christ and I still serve him and want to serve him daily. So we're going to figure out how ourselves look and if we're okay with opening that up, ultimately at some point along the way, when someone looks at you, they're not going to see you. We want them to see the Christ in us. And the only way we do that is allow ourselves to be, to be prodded through this idea of introducing our self, real self to the world. Not the 20,000 picture self, but the self that we know who Christ says we are. And this is, by the way, this is just a snippet of who he says we are. God sees you. He sees you through the eyes of Christ, and he's not going to reject you. My prayer for you this morning is that last line, you understand that whoever, however you are, whatever you are, whatever you've been through, whatever you experience, what you're experiencing now, what you experienced in the past, what you'll experience in the future is the reality of who you are and got news for you, it's okay. Because that's the reality of who you are. It is not the selfie. It's the reality of who you are. And he loves you in it. And he sees you in it. And when he looks at you, he sees Jesus. I want the band to come back this morning, if you will. Uh, something that a few months ago I started doing to Lisa and I kind of had a conversation about it. You know, we've done it a few times, and sometimes you'll do a, a message, and, and, man, you'll just grab hold of, and y'all, you don't have to play. Y'all can just get in place for a second because I might want to talk another 20 minutes, so y'all y'all just hang in there. I said, we were just talking, and I'd preached a message one Sunday, and she said, man, I, I thought of this song would be perfect for that. I said, man, you know, that'd be just a great way to end the song and have a moment of meditation about that. Let those words speak as words as well. And So we've done it a few times and back and forth, and, and, and I'm just going to just really kind of just be a little vulnerable with you this morning. I, it's this journey that we're about, that we're taking, that we've been taking, sometimes it's difficult for us to, to just say, man, we're striving to be good leaders. And in our brokenness and our weakness and our fail, sometimes that's hard because the last thing I ever want to do is to throw up a selfie in front of you and not be who I really am. And sometimes it always doesn't work together. And that was been the past week for me is trying to put this message together and talk together to just be perfect. And I just, man, I struggled with it all week. Oh, gosh, Pastor, you were away for four weeks. You should have just knocked this baby right out. You should have a whole year in the, in the can. Guess what I don't have in the can? I don't have a whole year. I didn't even have a week. But I know it's what God's speaking to us and what we're desiring God to move this church into. So I walked in this morning and I said to Lisa, I said, hey, I got the perfect song to end the day. And she kind of, eyes were like this big. <laughs> I said, we can do this. And here's why. Because the song says, the song talks about who I am. 
And the very essence of who I am is how he sees me. And it's the desire of this pastor that God sees us through Jesus' eyes. When he looks at you, you need to understand that. And so I want to end with two things today. We're going to end with this song, but I end with something really corny today. Just go ahead and shift in your seat now. Because what I'm going to present to you now is super, super corny. But it's something I hope that when I present it to you, that it just, it burns into your brain. Because you will understand that regardless of who you are, he sees you through the eyes of Jesus. Are you ready? I don't think you are. Take a look. This. Go ahead, Jimmy. You'll never get time back on this image ever, Jimmy. It's my one chance to have hair that looks like yours. Listen, sacrilegious this is not, so don't, don't, don't panic. I mean, the people around us, man, they should have seen what they were doing. They were unbelievable. They were like, hey, that's Jesus. No, they really weren't doing that. Corny, corny, corny. But let me help you understand something. You and I have a self that's riddled with stuff. And we forget to understand that he's giving everything I need in my life to live daily for him. And we forget to understand sometimes that he is the God of our life and he speaks all truth and wisdom into us. And we forget sometimes that we have everything we need. He has given us everything, so scripture says, to live according to his way. And sometimes we forget that and we go. Ch-ch-ch. And we're just, we're going to deal with ourselves for a few weeks, okay? And we're going to start today by recognizing this very simple truth that you are who I say I am. Not what the world around me says I am, not what I say I am, but who you say that I am. So we're going to sing this song today called Who You Say I Am. And I'm going to invite you to to maybe not do what we would normally do in the space, which is like just get behind the lyrics and just belt them out and sing them. Maybe for the first half, maybe just take a few moments and take some inventory. Take some perspectives of where you are and understanding where you are in life. Because got news for you. If you feel like you haven't made some mark, guess what? He knows that you haven't made that mark because he sees you. It's just beautiful. It's the most beautiful message in the world. And when he looks at you, he sees Jesus. He sees his grace and his love and his mercy cascading over you. And when that happens, when when you recognize that, then the world looks at you and they see Jesus. It's all about him and what he's done for us. And we are who he says he is. Father, this morning... There are people in this room, I know. Man, I know this because I were one and I am one who so diligently love you with our our full hearts today. Somehow maybe we've missed a step or somehow maybe we've come to a place where we are not there the way we know we need to be. Some of us may be in this room, Lord. We've never even one time asked you into our life. Today we... If that is us, may this be the moment today. May they find someone and share with us after service up front as we're here waiting. Hey, man, I, I'm not sure what this looks like, but I need I need to move in Christ. I need something to happen in my life. There's some of us that are here for a whole litany of other reasons, and we reach the whole gamut. We, we span the length of an understanding today that you love us. And so, God, there... I know this, and and, and we won't climb this whole mountain on a Sunday morning in 35 minutes and in a song and in a prayer. I know we won't climb the mountain because sometimes we think we do climb the mountain of total completeness, and I know that you work in our lives and you touch us and you transform us, but this is a journey of life with you, and today some of us need to just recognize we need to take the first step onto the mountain to start climbing. That admittal comes with maybe looking at ourselves and saying we're not who we thought we were, but we are as you see us. So God, this morning, in the next few moments as we meditate and share with this message in our life and share it with ourselves today, we introduce ourselves to you, Lord Jesus. Thank you.
Amen. Hey, thank you guys so much for singing with us uh, this morning. I want to go ahead and be seated for just two seconds. Just going to button up kind of our day today. I want to just uh, thank you for being here. Listen, if you're a first-time guest today, we have some friends in the back here, and they're wearing lanyards, and they're very, very nice. And here's the deal. We have actually a lunch coming up that we'd love to invite you to. And so go and talk to them. They'll give you information about signing up. That's coming up on November the 10th. We call that our lunch at the Grove. It's a lot of fun. We just kind of hang out. We treat you to a lunch, and we kind of learn more about you, and you learn more about us. We just kind of get to know you. So see my friends in the back there. They'd love to help you out with that. Also, this Wednesday, we're going to be calling just a little bit of an audible on our community. So we always do homes on the fourth Wednesday. Everybody say fourth Wednesday. It's always in the fourth. And then sometimes, like this month, you have a fifth Wednesday. And so we do different things every fifth Wednesday. Tonight, as you know, is our trunk or treat. So sometimes on the fifth Wednesday, we do like a big party. But we're having that party tonight. So here's what we want you to do this week in community. This week, you're going to meet in community, but not here. Because we're really trying to move our groups to learn to be able to, to do community in other places, in homes. That's kind of one of our really end goals for that. So community group leaders... Do whatever you want to do with your groups this week, but we're going to ask you to not just do, like, fellowship time with them. Like, go have fun, go bowling or whatever, but pretend that we were here as well. So how would you merge those two worlds to really help make sure that you're making disciples and you guys are growing in those questions? So that's going to be on your own this week. Community group leaders, as you decide, if you have questions, reach out to your shepherds or reach out to me. I'll help you out with that. Tonight, though, don't forget, is Trunk or Treat at 4.30. I know that it rained all morning. I checked the weather while you were speaking. I was listening the whole time. And uh, it's not going to rain at all. Zero percent from like 1 o'clock forward, okay? So you guys are welcome to come. Uh, you can come early, obviously, and set up. We're going to open up at 4.30. We're going to have uh, some games. We're going to have food tonight. We've invited all of our neighbors from next door at Glass Creek to come. So let's be prayerful that they come. And you guys be ready with your costumes to introduce yourself and be friendly uh, for our neighbors. We're then about... 530, uh, we're going to pumpkin drop it, okay? And that means that the kids can now be released to go and uh, trick-or-treat around the cars. So bring your candy, bring your cars. Maybe you say to yourself, I didn't sign up for this, you know? Well, I can't come. But I really would love to because John just motivated me. And I say to you, as Pastor said, no one will reject you here. Just get your trunk, throw some candy in it, come follow us and be here tonight, and you can just come and have a blast. You don't have to have a costume even. We would love for you to, but just come, and uh, we would love for you to be here tonight for Trunk or Treat. And finally, as always, don't forget that we engage in the sacred act of giving every week. And so there's a little station there, and there's all kinds of ways you can give. You can give online, you can give via the app on your phone. But that's important. Just like we sing, just like that we are in community, uh, we support God's kingdom and support one another in God's kingdom. So make sure that you're faithful to that. Guys, we love you so much. Hope you have a great rest of the day. We'll see you at 430 tonight and uh, have a good afternoon.